Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you all so early this morning. Thanks for getting up and being so accommodating and uh, dealing with our adjustment and schedule. We're very pleased to, uh, to have the secretary here at 1030 this morning, and so we had to move everything up earlier this morning. Um, I'm Laura McGifford Slover. I'm the Vice President of Content and Policy Research at Achieve, and I've had the great pleasure of working with many of you for a very long time, and it's great to see everyone back here for the annual meeting. I have a very special panel with me today, and I'm going to introduce them in a moment, but um, I think you know who they are. Uh, they are the lead writers for the Common Core State Standards Initiative, and I thought I'd spend just a couple minutes framing our conversation today. Um, and, and telling you things that you probably know, and then telling you a few things that you may not know about our writers. Um, obviously, you know that the idea for the Common Core Standards has been a very long time in the making. The need has become increasingly clear. As the United States becomes increasingly mobile, it no longer made sense to have 50 sets of standards. As the world has become more global and flat, it has become increasingly important for American students to be prepared to compete with students around the globe. And as the need for post-secondary education and training has become increasingly the norm for good jobs in this global economy, it became clear that to prepare students for anything less than readiness for those jobs was inadequate and unacceptable. So there is the need. We know that. That's part of the thing you already know. Uh, and the foundation of that, the work for developing common standards has also been laid over a number of years as states, you all in this room, have begun the work of aligning your standards with the demands of colleges and careers and requiring students to take the courses they need to cover that content and working very hard with your communities, your higher ed and post-secondary leaders, your business communities to engage them in that effort. So this has been going on for a while, and ACHIEVE has been part of that work. We've helped catalyze that movement, and we reported about um, this movement towards becoming more common um, two years ago in our report, Out of Many One. But even as you all moved closer to that goal of becoming more consistent, there was still great variation um, and major inequities that you recognized, and therefore a growing appetite for commonality. And it was into that environment that the Common Core State Standards Initiative was born. Um, in early 2009, uh, the National Governors Association and the Council of Chief State School Officers formally launched uh, the effort and had a kickoff meeting in April of 2009. And many of you were there, and you'll probably remember it as I do as sort of a watershed event where people spoke really eloquently and passionately about the need for this um, movement towards commonality. And in fact, Chris Cook. Um, quoted from the Gettysburg Address, and he sent every participant in the room a copy of the Gettysburg Address. It was that kind of really powerful event. Um, and that spurred the 13-month development process that resulted in the Common Core State Standards, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, the work was led by a great many people, and I'm going to forget them, but I want to take a moment to try to acknowledge the people uh, who were part of this incredible effort. Um, first of all, Chris Minnick from CCSSO and Eileen Berman from NGA did a great job herding all of the troops. Um, Achieve, ACT, and the College Board staffed early writing teams and were part of an advisory body along with NASB and SHEO. Uh, there were extended writing teams with national experts. There was deep engagement with teachers, school administrators, higher education faculty, business leaders, and a great number of national organizations. And at this point, there are so many who were so instrumental, and I'm going to forget some and then be really embarrassed later, so I'm not even going to try to name them, but they were much appreciated. Um, on the Achieve staff, Morgan Saxby and Doug Sabdi were instrumental in the work, and many others. Um, and of course, there were the 48 states that signed on to participate as development partners. And a great number of those of you in this room spent your personal time and your personal energy um, working on the standards, providing input, review, feedback. Um, and as one of the people who reviewed the literally thousands of pages of feedback, um, I can tell you that the states took this endeavor very seriously um, and did an amazing job providing feedback to the writers. And the standards are all the better for it. Um, but in the end, as we all know, standards writing is not something that can be fully achieved by a committee. Um, someone must have the pen. And we were lucky, incredibly lucky, all of us, to have had such an excellent team of writers holding the pen. 
and four of them are here with us today. And in a moment, I'm going to sit down and be quiet so we can hear from them. But first, I want to take a moment to tell you a couple things that you may or may not know about the standards writers. And I'm going to put their names up in lights, if it works, so that um, they get their name in lights for this incredible 13-month effort. Um, first of all, Sue Pimentel. Um, she's the founder of an organization called Standards Work which specializes in standards-driven school reform, and she works as an education writer, analyst, and consultant. She's been an Achieve consultant for a number of years. She's one of the best policy minds out there and really, really deep content knowledge. Um, she earned her bachelor's in science in early childhood education and a law degree from Cornell University. She was our standards team lawyer. Um, she worked initially in the Maryland State Legislature she served as a policy advisor for the Maryland uh, Governor William Donald Schaefer, and then she served as special counsel to former Superintendent John Murphy in Prince George's County, very close to here. Um, in recent years, she has really focused her work on academic standards and principal evaluation, student assessment, and accountability. And in October 2007, Sue was appointed to the National Assessment Governing Board, so she is a member of the NAGB board. So not only is she helping shape the nation's standards, she's also helping shape NAEP. Um, David Coleman. David Coleman, David Coleman. Many of you have gotten to know these guys very well, so maybe I'm just telling you things you already know. David is the founder and CEO of Student Achievement Partners, uh, which serves foundations and school districts and states. Um, many of you may have known David in his previous role as the founder of the Grow Network, which um, he built from scratch. Um, and was acquired in 2005 by McGraw-Hill, and it's now become the nation's leader in assessment reporting and customized instructional materials. So it's all of the reports and data and information that go to students and their parents. David has helped revolutionize that market. Um, little known fact about David, he was a lecturer at the University of London um, before going to work pro bono um, in the area of education at McKinsey and Company. Um, and he is a Rhodes Scholar and a graduate of Yale University, Oxford University, and Cambridge University. He's very well traveled and um, one, of, uh, one of the lead standards writers and um, the third English language arts standards writer. Could not be with us today, Jim Patterson from ACT. Uh, we had a very, very strong ELA team and many of you got to work very closely with them, as did I. On the math side, William McCallum, Bill McCallum. Uh, a university distinguished professor and head of the Department of Mathematics at the University of Arizona. He received his PhD in mathematics from Harvard University in 1984, not to make you sound old, um, under, the supervision, <laughs> under the supervision of Barry Mazur, who I gather is a very prominent mathematician. Um, he spent years at University of California, Berkeley, and at the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute in Ber Berkeley before joining the faculty at the University of Arizona in 1987. He's a member of the Harvard Calculus Consortium and the lead author of that consortium's multivariate calculus and college algebra text. He's a very um, renowned scholar in his field. In 2005, he received the Director's Award for Distinguished Teaching Scholars from NSF. And in 2006, he founded the Institute for Mathematics and Education at the University of Arizona and has worked very closely trying to move the field of teacher education um, through better uh, education and more engagement in policy issues. Um, he chairs that board still and um, has been an achieved consultant for a long time. It's a pleasure, Bill. Um, Jason Zimba. Jason Zimba uh, is a faculty member in physics, mathematics, um, and a member of the Center for Advancement of Public Action at Bennington College, where he's been since 2004. Uh, he is a mathematical physicist, so he was instrumental in making sure that the mathematics standards as they were developed also would have good connections into the science and STEM field. Um, his work has appeared in a number of journals, and during uh, the process of writing the standards, he also published a book. Um, these guys just don't sleep. Um, his awards inclu include a Rhodes Scholarship and a U.S. Department of Education Fellowship, and he was instrumental in helping David Coleman found the GROW Network, uh, for which he served as the head of education. He received his degree from Williams College, a degree from Oxford, and a Ph.D. from the University of California at Berkeley. The third writer, Phil Darrow, could not be here with us today, but if you look at this team, you will see an incredible uh, collective expertise. Um, they were talented, they worked incredibly hard, 
And um, as someone who was very closely involved with the standards development process, I have to say it was one of the most rewarding professional experiences, in large part because I got to work with such incredible, um, brilliant minds. Okay, I'm setting them up. Yes. That's exactly what I was setting them up for. Um, before I sit down and be quiet, the, the other interesting thing about our effort um, over 13 months was um, that the six writers came out actually being um, very good personal friends. Um, and in part because they had a lot of life changes happen during the process of writing these standards. So along with um, uh, Chris and Eileen uh, there, and the four of the writers, there were three new babies three new babies amongst a group of seven. That was pretty impressive. Um, eight, sorry. Uh, one wedding engagement. Chris Minnick got engaged during that process. Amazing woman with amazing patience. And, um, and zero divorces. So, so far, thank you, yes. All right, so I'm gonna sit down and we're gonna turn it over to the panel. And I'm gonna transfer to my mic here, okay. So what I think would be most interesting for folks to hear about, um, we're not going to walk through the standards as a play-by-play -play because 36 states have now adopted. You all know what's in the standards. Hopefully you've done those analyses and you all have um, come to the conclusion that they're pretty darn good. What I want to have you guys focus on today is what are the major advancements? What are the key differences um, between the common core state standards and existing state standards? Um, what do you consider to be the biggest transformational possibility? Um, other than the fact that they are common now across 36 states and the District of Columbia. And what are the distinctive features that you think will ultimately really drive um, improved student achievement? So I'm going to turn to Sue on my left for a first crack at that. Great. Well, good morning. You know, when uh, Laura said 8 in the morning, I really expected we might have like two tables we'd be, <laughs> and we'd have a discussion. I am amazed. So um, welcome to you all. So the biggest advancement, I, um, Laura mentioned that I'm on the Nagy board, and it's another hat I wore um, uh, when I was doing the Common Core, and uh, that oversees NAEP, the National Assessment. And that drove and propelled a lot of our work. I know both David and Jim felt um, a, a, as strongly as I did about that. I am just not about reading in the newspaper in two years, in five years, in seven years, in 10 years, that the reading scores are flat as a pancake. 40 years, we've barely had a tick up, and the gap remains. We've given all this attention. So what is it, we asked ourselves, what is it that our standards haven't done that they now need to do? So this would be what I think is our biggest advancement. And that is, these standards focus on what students should read, not only on what students should do with what they read. And they do this in two vital ways. Um, and those of you, I know many of you in the room, helped us um, with the standards. So you know this and you heard us say this time and again. And that is, the first vital way is we really focus on text complexity. That is the complexity of the text that students should be reading. A progression all the way through. Because we know two things. One, that, they're, that when you get up into college and careers, it's beyond what we know students are reading at 12th grade. And we know that the complexity of what students have been reading has been going down over the decades. So there's a gap there. And we know from reading between the lines, if you haven't picked up the ACT report of reading between the lines, it says the, the students that have the best chance of success in college are those that can read the complex text. So it's not whether I can figure out a main idea or David can figure out a main idea. It's whether or not we can do that with a complex text. So that's one vital way. You've, and we have that in Appendix A. We have a whole series of things in Appendix B. We have a standard, um, standard number 10 on, 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 uh, on uh, reading complex text. The second vital way we deal with um, students reading is that we say students have to read a range of, of texts and, and we really focus on informational text. And we say that in ELA classes on literary nonfiction and we say that, we, you notice the title of the standards are uh, ELA and literacy in history, social studies, science, and technical subjects. 
because we know about 80% of what students read when they leave school, whether it's in life, it's in college, it's in careers, is informational text. And so we've put that into the standards. We've actually adopted the NAEP percentages of by the time they're in high school, they should be reading 70% across the curriculum of informational text and 30% in your narrative fiction. And those are, so the biggest advancement, I think, is focusing on, on, what, students, on what students read. And I've yacked enough. David, did you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I want to add some thanks to Achieve for humiliating us unexpectedly before we get to it. Um, Not humiliating. But, but, but more seriously, um, as, we, as we meet here at the American Diploma Project, I think it is worth saying how much the Common Standards effort builds on the shoulders of work like ADP that, built, that brought states together in common to find between them a power stronger than themselves. And I think had not that long work been done, there's no way we would have moved so quickly now. So I think it's false to say this was an incredibly fast process where suddenly the nation came together on common standards. It is the slow, hard work of many in this room that have built that platform. And the second aspect of that work I'd mentioned that Sue alluded to is in this room are many of the states with whom we closely partnered with to build the standards. Our design aim was not just to find what was common. That would have been easy. The design aim was to build on the best of state work. And thank you for being our colleagues in that and guiding us as we did it. Um, I'll only add one thing to what Sue said about what's distinctive in the standards, um, which, is that it, which is to move to writing for a minute. In America today, there are two kinds of writing that are the most popular if you look at middle school and high school, besides texting, which is not typically given credit. Um, <laughs> and those two forms of writing, as you all probably know, are narrative writing about a, about a personal experience or expository writing about a personal opinion. The only problem about these two forms of writing is they don't get you very far in career or college. That is, people in this world, sadly, are not very interested in our opinions. They're much more interested as to whether we have an argument with evidence. So they care much less about, quote unquote, what you think or feel. They care a lot about what you can prove or show with evidence. In terms of personal narrative, narrative like compelling, and, and it develops throughout the standards, we have to face much more frankly the fact that it is rare in college and rare in the workplace that someone says, Johnson, I need a market report on my desk tomorrow. But before that, I would like a compelling personal narrative. <laughs> in that spirit, the standards focus, as Nate does, on the focused development of the ability to argue with evidence and the ability to convey information in a clear way. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come back and ask a question, but I want to hear from the math team first um, what you think the greatest advancements in the mathematics field are in terms of the standards. And I'm going to look to Bill first. Go ahead. Um, well, uh, bearing in mind that I just got off a flight from San Diego <laughs> about two hours ago, so what I say may... And, and <coughs> managed to take a shower. <laughs> 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 Thank goodness. <laughs> um, uh, so what I, what I have to say might be slightly incoherent. I think actually coherence uh, is one of the big advances in the math standards. Um, coherence and focus. In particular, focus on the uh, number and operations in the early grades leading up to algebra and a sort of coherent mathematical description of what that means from grade level to grade level. Fairly carefully laid out pathway detailing how understanding of whole numbers, fractions grows and prepares for algebra. The um, coherence doesn't just mean mathematical coherence, it means coherence between grade levels where uh, standards progress and where there's a sort of building block aspect to what happens in K through 8. When I say this is a great advancement, it's not as if this is a new idea. Um, I think this is what everybody wanted, of course, for all these years. And I, I, I don't want to overemphasize somehow uh, um, a magical event that happened in the last year. The fact that the standards were common and that there was common support for someone to write common standards is what made it possible for us to do that. I don't know if you have anything to add to Just, that. Uh, you know, implicit in everything we've been saying is how can standards be designed to raise achievement in both of these subjects? And we recognize that achievement is downstream of the standards. Achievement doesn't happen between the covers of the book. And what we're really talking about are the ways that we try to design the book to promote higher achievement later. And so that's, that's a common theme in everything we're saying in terms of looking at the evidence of the challenges kids are going to face uh, after high school in terms of uh, complex text and nonfiction, uh, and uh, in terms of looking at the evidence from high performing countries about uh, the sources of high achievement in math. And those two sources are essentially, as Bill said, focus and coherence. Focus 
creates conditions uh, for sustained attention, practice, and mastery of the foundations uh, of algebra in particular. And coherence uh, recognizes that mathematics is a sense-making activity. Mathematics is the one subject that you can study in which the truth or falsehood is of an assertion is, is, uh, is available w without reference to facts. <laughs> so it, <laughs> it's in your head. <laughs> and uh, so the standards should make sense, to, not to put too fine a point on it. And having standards that grow in their ideas over time is a way of helping it make sense in the, in the mind of the, of the student eventually, which is where the, where the learning actually happens, as I say, not in the book. Thank you. Just a follow-up question, really, for, for whoever wants to, to jump in. Um, Sue started us off by talking about the, the fact that these are not just um, English language arts standards. They are interdisciplinary standards. They're literacy standards that go really across the curriculum. Can you talk about um, that, both the implications, um, what, what the intention was a little bit more, and then um, can you respond on the math side about what the implications are for math as well as for other fields? Perhaps science, Jason. So talk a little bit about that first. David, you start. OK. The, um, to clarify, the shifts that happen in English language arts happen from the earliest grades. So, so let me start, if it's OK, at the beginning, and then we'll go through to literacy and history and science. The overwhelming research finding, if you look at state testing today, it is overwhelmingly focused on literature, and that 80% of it in K-5, I'm talking particularly about elementary testing of, liter of reading, you'd find 80% of the exams focus on literature and 20% of it roughly on informational text. Why does that matter so much? Because in those kindergarten through fifth grade years, students are as crucially learning literature, but remember through reading and through speaking and listening, they're gaining knowledge about the world through science and mathematics. So that's the <coughs> crucial years, actually, for building a general knowledge that will serve them extremely well in a general knowledge that will help them read better, but also, of course, participate in history and the sciences themselves. So by, by changing the balance of text, as Sue described, you're saying of the K-5 classroom that it must be balanced between reading literature and reading informational text, particularly science and history, science, I say science and technical, history and social studies, as a way of learning emphatically about the world and growing and learning about that. In the later grades, in sixth through twelfth grade, uh, what we designed is a world where the English language arts teacher begins to pay more serious attention to literary nonfiction in the past, in, than in the past. So we're not asking for English language arts teachers to teach technical manuals, as some people have tried to insinuate or say. That's not the aim of this. The aim is to read documents like the Declaration, great pieces of historical work from their rhetorical and argumentative understanding, great essays, biography, these acts of narrative and argument that are so powerful in the language, but nonfiction combined with literature. And then to demand, not to ask, but to demand that equally in the sciences and history, that there's a demonstration that kids can read and gain knowledge through those activities. That is, kids can read a dense scientific text and get knowledge from it, as well as they can a historical text and write about them. And as you turn to implementation, our greatest hope is that you don't just add these things, but rather you think of changing the assessment structure you have gradually to approach these things. That is, we would invite states over the course of the next few years, as the new generation of assessments is being developed, to think of rebalancing their assessment gradually towards this equal balance of information and literary text in kindergarten through fifth grade in their later testing of reading to try to balance between kids encountering literary, historical, and scientific text so that that expectation is beginning to emerge and felt in the heartbeat of the work before the new test. He, okay. he said it. Thank you. Um, from the mathematics perspective, how can the standards for literacy infuse the work that goes on in the mathematics classroom? We, uh, th right now, the literacy standards uh, don't explicitly address mathematics. Uh, there's, I think the, um, the opportunity that still exists and, and that we might be able to do something with at some point is to create the, the, right, the exact parallel or analog of the ELA standards for literacy and science, history, social science, technical subjects, would be standards for quantitative literacy mm -hmm. in science, history, social sciences, health, government, civics, all the things that we want math to be able to be used for. Because of the siloing of academic mm -hmm. disciplines, we don't today have good standards for that. So rather than moving the reading of text into mathematics, it's more important to move mathematics out of, out of its box. That's a nice analogy. Actually, this is a good, seg good time to segue um, 
into, I've got my eye on the clock because we're under tight time restrictions today. So I want to segue into the implementation issue. Um, because now that we've adopted 36 states and, the, and DC, um, really uh, the challenge becomes what do you do to implement faithfully and to really move the needle on student achievement. Uh, many states and districts have already started working this summer with teams of teachers to take a look at the standards, to unpack them, um, if you will. And I thought we could have a moment to talk about what you think the do's and don'ts of impl implementation are, what you recommend states really do or um, not do. Um, and what's most important to do in the short term versus um, what can wait and come on down the road. So I don't know who, right. let's start over here okay, with we'll Sue. Start over here. Well, and David and I have been doing a lot of talking about this. Um, our recommendation, um, and, and something I know that we'll be working along with those of you who want us to work along with you on, is not to try to do everything, but to select some, what we say, key levers of, uh, that will really change performance. And if I were to tick some of those off, I would say that where teachers really need some help, which is in literary nonfiction, um, ELA teachers are likely to reach back and, and go right back to the narrative fiction because where is the literary nonfiction that's supposed to be working with their students? What are they supposed to be doing with the literary nonfiction that, that they do? We have a big um, uh, emphasis on, on evidence in our standards. So that would be another area of what does evidence look like? And we know by the NAEP test, the difference between students who score proficient and students that don't is whether or not they're able to give the right kind of quantity and quality of evidence. Um, K2 is another area that we think that we, we need to work on because, um, and it's not just, um, and we think that all this needs to go hand in hand with, um, we're, we're talking about instead of implementation, really what will affect performance. And, and I'm going to let David speak to that as well, but I want to say one of the um, things that I think we could all say as a chorus is one of the don'ts um, on, on working was one, try to put together a huge, big, huge, fat document um, that teachers aren't going to like really read. Um, we, we want students, so what we would say is have the teachers read the standards closely and then act on them. And there are some key ways they can act on them um, that are in, 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 keeping with the, in keeping with the standards. So forget like all a lot of objectives and all this other kind of la di la di la di but allow teachers to really read the standards. And if I could say just one more thing, and that is um, one of the things I know in working with teachers across the country um, uh, is that we need to give teachers time to work together with this and to really talk about this and do something with it. It's the difference between, last night, I'll give you an example. I went from Alexandria to Arlington, and I had a cab driver take me. Now, I noticed we were in Courthouse Square, so I knew how to get back, or at least I could tell the cab driver. We were on Jameson. After that, my mind wandered. Then we got on GW Parkway. I knew Spout Run, da, da. Okay, if I had to drive from Alexandria to Arlington, I would have known every turn I had to take. I would have known about how long it would have taken me to do. So that's the difference between just handing standards to teachers and handing them a bunch of tools versus asking them to have a conversation about it and to read it closely. Hmm. David? Well, I've been, when I think about implementation, I think that there is the easiest way to tell someone who worked on the standards from someone who didn't, which is the person who didn't always says, Standards were the easy part. Now let's get on to implementation. <laughs> if that is true, well, implementation is going to be very hard indeed, I've got to tell you. <laughs> get um, ready, right? Uh, the, the other funny thing is that, is that the least likely request that we expected as we did these standards is that once we were done, the first thing everyone would ask for was more standards. That is, people would say, you know, those are great standards, but we've developed some really terrific student objectives to go with the standards. And you're like, huh. I could have sworn the standards were student objectives. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, or we all say and say, you know, we need, we need to unpack or really say what the standards said because the teachers won't read the standards. And you're like, huh, that's a great idea. If they won't read the book you wrote, write another. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think the big don't here, when Sue says read the standards and act, I think we have to be very careful of recreating another body of material before we closely encounter the standards themselves and creating a wall between them. Um, and we want to be careful. The good news is we're really sticking together as a group, as a team, to try to give coherent and 
clear answers as to what they mean when need be or what might be next, but not to let it become a jumble. I, I would say with that that, that, the, that what Sue and I see as most promising in terms of focused action typically unite assessment and curriculum. We are not convinced that if we just beg people to pay attention to common standards because they're really good for kids, uh, while they also have a lot of other work to do, we are likely to get their attention, to be rather frank. So if we want to make change, if we want to drive towards performance in these early years, we think that states need to think of these together. So if we begin from the beginning, and I'll be brief, in K2 we think is an extraordinary opportunity for rapid movement if states are interested in more aggressive action there. That is, there's been a discussion about teacher effectiveness throughout this country, but if we are unable to measure the progress of students and teachers in K2, that is, if we can't answer the question, has a student made adequate progress in kindergarten, in first grade, in second grade, towards these ambitious goals in early mathematics and early literacy, we are going to be holding the bag when more ambitious assessment kicks in at the third grade. So we think focusing on assessment in K2, as we said, balancing reading assessment when it goes beyond K2 to equally cover literary and informational text would be a great way to begin to get people focused on the standards and performance. And we're doing a lot of thinking about early steps in K2. Similarly, as, I, as, as Sue suggested, focusing in the later grades on making the demand of reading out in the disciplines as early and strongly as possible so that science and history teachers are enrolled in your team very early on in terms of what they're doing. And, and to put that very simply, because I want to keep it very simple, we're trying to design a simple task that could be focused on today that could ready kids and teachers to really encounter the standards in a serious way. And it begins with, with writing in a sense in that what's typically happened in writing assessments, as you know, is you have to kind of hide the prompts because you don't want the kids to know them in advance so that they can't write the essay in advance. So if the prompt is, what should we do with garbage? Should we throw it in the river or we should throw it in a landfill? Or what do you do with your summer vacation? These are things that have to be hidden so they don't prepare. Imagine instead a set of prompts for writing that are based on the standards themselves that everyone knows in advance. That is, what is the argument of the author and what is the evidence that supports it? So we could create a few of those very quickly. Then the challenge or surprise to the student is, what is the text that they're going to confront where they have to do that with? That is, is it a piece of literary nonfiction? Is it a piece of history of science? What piece? And they have to encounter that unexpected text read it with confidence, take evidence from it, and write about it. We think if they begin to be able to do just that thing, if that became a model for interim assessment, that very clear they would get to know the standards and their demands, they would begin to read closely in the disciplines, and they'd begin to work on writing in a quite fact-based way. So we're trying to design tasks like that that exemplify the standards so that stu teachers and students have good work to do immediately. Thank you. So that's, that's actually a, a very different model of assessment where assessments are not tricky. They're not meant to trip kids up. They are meant to be part of an integrated um, process of curriculum instruction and uh, part of a student's daily, daily work, which makes a lot of sense. I want to turn to math. Um, we are running out of time, and I want to give time for the audience to at least ask a couple questions. So if you have a question, start thinking of it. There are mic runners, and we'll get to you in just a moment. But on the math side, what, is the, what are the most important do's and don'ts in terms of implementation well, and the implications for assessment, if you will, in the, in the long run? I want to pick up talking. on this word, unpacking, because that to me brings up an image of my beautifully packed suitcase <laughs> <laughs> where someone's just sort of tearing things out and throwing them all over the room. Um, <laughs> I th prefer to think of unfolding the standards. Um, the standards are fairly intricately put together in some <laughs> ways um, and crafted to produce these pro progressions and coherence that I talked about. Um, so I think we do need, uh, one of the challenges of implementation is to help teachers unfold the standards. That is the way you might take a piece of origami and figure out how it was put together by slowly unfolding it. And I think that's going to be important work. One of the big challenges for the standards is that they put a demand on teachers to know not only what it is they're teaching right now, but to know what came before and to know what's coming after and to know how it all fits, to, fits together in a much more sort of serious way than, the, than that demand has been put on them before. So I think there's a professional development um, uh, demand on the teachers um, or there's, a, there's an issue with, with helping the teachers do that, which is part of implementation. Um, I should mention that uh, the math team is in the process of producing some supplementary documents which we had intended originally to be part of the standards, namely progressions documents that will give narrative progressions across <laughs> grades 
of, uh, of themes in the standards. And um, that work is actually just about getting underway, funded by the Brookhill Foundation. And then the other project that we have that we're still getting started is a project to develop sample tasks that illustrate the standards. And I think those will both help with implementation. Thank, Thank you. you. Jason. Yeah, I mean, ag agreeing with what's been said, that there are immediate term, you know, medium term and long term uh, horizons to think about these things. In the immediate term, obviously, you want to you do things that are uh, easy for people and very low cost. And I mean, the good news is there, there are things you can do. Like, uh, if, <laughs> if you're doing probability in grade two, well, not doing it is free. <laughs> uh, and that means the test blueprint. It could mean the curriculum you're working with. Uh, it could mean the professional development sessions you're doing. Um, I say probability, and that plays into you know what, what Bill was saying about unfolding. In, in physics, classically, there's only two things to know about something. Where is it and where is it going? Those two dimensions are both important. So we don't just ask, I'm in third grade, OK, what are the topics? You can't create a math curriculum by plunking topics down in grades. Uh, and yet, the first conversation you probably have to have with the, the teaching and learning community is what topics and what grades. So do have that conversation, but go as quickly as you can to how those topics flow from grade to grade. Because some of the biggest innovations and, and we hope designs for raising achievement in the standards have to do with this coherence of how things flow from grade to grade. So the, the immediate and medium term challenge in professional development and in curriculum is to, is to, um, is to make the, the flow of ideas in the standards more visible because it's dense and difficult today. Uh, and the documents Bill's talking about will do that. Uh, curriculum, next generation curriculum should do that better. And it's going to have to be the subject of conversations uh, with teachers. And do, doing exercises with teachers where they, where they do study the document and try to unfold it. Uh, professional development activities should be looking across grades for the reasons that, that Bill is saying. Well, it would be sort of a shame if um, now that 36 states and D.C. have adopted a common set of standards that they went about developing curriculum all on their own in a disparate kind of fashion. So one of the things you all might want to consider is whether there's some curriculum work to be done um, in a really cohesive way. Okay, sorry, I'm like signing you up for more work. <laughs> They'll kill me afterwards. Um, at this point, rather than ask additional questions, I want to open it up to the audience. We've got Mike Runners. Who has a question for the standards writers? I see one in the back. Joe? Hi, Joe. Hello. Great job, you guys. Every one of you did a super job. Um, theoretical question is, if I were to buy a whole new staff, just perfectly tailored to um, properly implementing these standards, what's the profile of this human capital that I'm purchasing? And I'm doing it for the whole state. So we're starting from scratch, let's say. What's the profile of the new teacher? Who wants to take a crack at that one? Wow. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll say a word, a word about the person, but um, I think the, the standards we've tried to deliver in math put the math back in math standards. And so, so a, a person who's maybe a little less panicked uh, about what's on the test and a little, a little um, a little more curious and interested about what's in the standards. Uh, and and um, the test will take care of itself if the kids learn what's in the standards. And I would say um, uh, people are really open and ready to learn and learn to do something differently and excited about that. Um, uh, rather than I'm sort of going to go back to what I did or the standards are over here and what I do in my classroom are over here. Um, so that's what I say I would be looking for. Again, I'll, I'm sorry to jump um, in twice on this, please. but another thing that has occurred to me and when people talk about the challenges of implementation, in some sense these standards are meant to be um, a gift to the teacher who has always had to decide what not to teach because there's too much stuff who has never been able to get to the depth on what is really deep, difficult, intricate, and interesting in mathematics. So this doesn't have to just be push. Uh, some, many of the teachers I've talked to are like, I can't wait until the mm -hmm. standards reflect my actual practice a little better than they do today. Huh. Well, that's say. a nice analogy. I, I will say there's going to be a um, session later yeah. at the breakout session where we can go a little bit deeper into the educator capacity questions. Um, so I'm going to see if there are any other questions from the audience. And David will be on that panel. Yes, Cheryl. 
Good morning. Um, wonderful, wonderful. You all know I think that about the standards. My question is, I believe the K-12 community is very well versed in standards. We, uh, through NCLB, through all the assessment, through all the pieces we've had in place. Please tell me where you think the higher ed community is in reference of standards as we all really dig into building that connection, college and career ready from K through. I'm going to turn it over to our resident <laughs> professors over here. Well, I mean, of course, that's always been a problem. Um, higher ed lack of involvement in K-12, but I would say these, uh, at least on the mathematics side, and I think probably also yeah. that was true on the ELA side, there was much more involvement of higher ed in the writing and preparation of these standards than is usual. And so that bodes well. Um, there certainly continues to be involvement um, uh, of higher ed through various efforts like um, the uh, APL, AL, APLU, uh, science and teacher imperative, whatever it's yes. called. Um, there are lots of efforts going on which are trying to link higher ed with the standards. So I'm not going to paint this rosy picture where suddenly this great, you know, um, efflorescence happens, but I think it's very promising how much involvement there was. A and that will have to be part of the work in each of your states to really <laughs> bring the higher ed community on board, um, get them familiar with the standards in a deep way, just like the K-12 educators um, in the way that Sue and David talked about. I think, I think, uh, in both ELA and math, in, in some ways, these standards are uh, a real gift to higher education by mm -hmm. taking seriously the demands that kids are going to face in college. I, I, I do think that higher education has to uh, resolve some of its own internal contradictions. Uh, they, like many, they love the focus. Now, if we could just add five more things. Yeah. <laughs> so if we can get them over that to where they are as focused on what is important for admissions as they are in what they know underlies kids' success. Some reconciling that within higher ed would be an important step to bringing them together. Uh, uh, it looks like we have time for one more question. I'm getting the signal. So Martha, would you do us the honor of yes, having the Yes, thanks, question? Laura. Uh, a question for Bill or for Jason. Uh, could you speak to the decisions that you made relative to the level of integration? Uh, I heard the term coherence, and I like that, that term, and that, that speaks to some of the issues we've had in our state in Georgia. But, but talk about, we are noticing that in the latest renditions and even in, in drafts before, the integration seems to be strengthening. Uh, could you guys speak to that a bit and, and how you decided how much integration or, or, or Are you talking you about high school, uh, high, particularly sorry, yes, in, in sort, of, high school sort of trying to at least lay, strands, lay foundations in it for yes, integrated curricula? In strands, yes. Yeah. Um, well, of course, that was sort of a tightrope um, to tread between, you know, different visions of how high school should go. And uh, our approach was to just describe the mathematics. And, uh, you know, one of the main mathematical ideas um, organized under conceptual themes that, that, that are contained in high school mathematics. And, strangely enough, that does support integrated curricula. <laughs> so, um, Some of the um, uh, most important high school mathematics is uh, algebraic methods of coordinate geometry. So in some sense, letting that stuff reveal itself um, is just a fact about mathematics. And it has nothing to do with what we call a course or don't call a course. It's, it's got to be done. And so in, in some ways, you know, it was complicated not being able to or not having to design the standards in courses. But, but being able to, to let the patterns in the, in the subject itself reveal themselves uh, you know, will hopefully have uh, breathe some of the new life into into both traditional and integrated courses in high schools, we hope. And for those of you who don't know, Achieve has um, done a set of model course <laughs> curricula, which are on our website and are now included as Appendix B of the standards, which show a, a possible way of organizing the standards into courses in high school. I'm getting lots of signals from the back of the room, but I've got to <laughs> wrap it up. So the standards writers will be here all day with us, so you'll get a chance to meet with them and talk to them individually if you'd like to. Uh, but it, I would like it at this point if you would join me in a round of applause for the great work they've done.